Um, so before I start talking about magnetic imaging with quantum sensors, let me just present you my team. Um, so we are working on defects in semiconductors mostly. Um, so in uh, silicon, in diamond, in bone nitride, many semiconductors. And uh, part of the team, including me, is working on using them as quantum sensors. And there's another part of the team working on ultra wide bone gap semiconductors, so in particular bone nitride. And this is a picture which looks like three. So you see, we are about 15 people at the moment. And so, as I said, I'm going to talk about quantum sensing applied to magnetism. So, um, first question is how, how would it work to use a quantum system to detect magnetism? So, let's take a very basic quantum system with just two levels. So, we are interested in magnetism, so it's going to be a spin. No surprise here. And uh, there's an important parameter, which is the frequency of this transition here, which is the magnetic resonance frequency. And you have several ways to, um, to perform your measurement. You can look at how to drive the transition with a resonant microwave field. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that today. You can look at a, an external static perturbation of your system, which is going to shift the energy levels and so change this magnetic resonance frequency. Or you can look at the effect of noise, which has a component at the resonance frequency, and it's going to modify the relaxation rate of the system. So I'm going to talk about these two approaches today. And um, the idea is that we want to do that at the nanoscale. And um, so it was proposed in uh, 2004 that uh, we could build a hybrid uh, set up made of an atomic force microscope. And at the end of the tip, we would have this quantum sensor as a probe for the physical quantities we are interested in, mostly magnetic fields uh, at the beginning. So this was a proposal by Chernobyl and Berman. And actually this was realized a few years later using uh, the Envy Center in Diamond as a quantum system. So the Envy Center is diamond is a defect in the carbon lattice of diamond, which is made of a nitrogen atom next to a vacancy. And uh, it has very nice properties, uh, meaning it's a photostable defect. It has a spin one, so we're gonna use it for sensing. Um, individual defects can be isolated and even implanted in a very uh, controlled manner nowadays. And uh, everything works under ambient conditions. Uh, so how is it going to work to measure magnetic field? So as I said, it's a spin one. So we have um, uh, the ground state is a spin triplet. So with a zero state and plus and minus one state. And so there's a zero field splitting of about three gigahertz. And uh, there are two very important properties. The first one is that the photoluminescence which is emitted depends on the spin state. So when the NV is in the state zero, it's emitting a lot of photons, but when it's in plus one and minus one, it's much darker. Second thing is that if you excite it with a green laser, you polarize it in the state zero. As a result of these two things, we can uh, detect optically the magnetic resonance of the system. So the idea is that you apply a microwave, you sweep the frequency of the microwave, you record the photoluminescence at the same time. And when you reach the transition frequency, you see a dip in your photoluminescence because you drive the transition from the bright to the dark state. And now the last step to reach magnetic field is that there is a Zeeman splitting of the plus one and minus one states in the presence of external field. And in your spectrum now, you have these two dips and the splitting between the dips is exactly proportional to the magnetic field. So that's how we do. And uh, we can reach a sensitivity of a few microtesla per square root of hertz with this. So as I said, we want to integrate this in an atomic force microscope. So the way to do that is we use special tips made uh, entirely of diamonds. So it's a diamond cantilever with a pillar, and at the end of the pillar, 
There is a single MD center which is in France. So we don't do this trip to buy them. You can buy them from several companies nowadays. This one is from the Kinemi company in Switzerland. And then we have the confocal microscope objective on top, which is bringing the green excitation and collecting the emitted photoluminescence. And we have the sample below, which is producing magnetic field. The key parameter in our setup is the distance between the MD center and the surface, which is uh, giving you the special resolution of the instrument. And usually we are in the range of 50 nanometers. So here is a picture of one of our setups. So we have two piezo stacks, one for the chip, one for the sample, and the objective just above. And you see the chip, it's the little green dot here. Okay, so today I'm going to show you a few things. Uh, the first one is that it's a great tool to look at antiferromagnets magnets, because as I said, we have a great sensitivity to small fields. And I will show you some recent work we did on bismuth ferrites, where we found some defects in the cycloidal structure. I will explain you afterwards. Um, then I will uh, talk about something completely different, which is uh, this relaxation part that I uh, mentioned at the beginning. Actually, when there is thermally excited spin waves in the material, it can uh, enhance the relaxation of the system. And you can use that actually to detect spin waves and in particular spin waves that are confined in some textures. And in the end, I will uh, give you an overview of other things we are doing because the uh, MD sensors are very versatile sensors and you can do a lot of other things. And I will even show you some other defects than MD sensors that we also use for sensing. So let's go to bismuth ferrite. So I warn you, bismuth ferrite is a mess. <laughs> it's extremely complicated. So I will make it as simple as possible. So the nice thing about bismuth ferrite is that it's a multiferric atom temperature. So that's why everybody is studying this with right. So it has an electric polarization along the 111 direction at room temperature, and it's an antiferromagnet. But it's not just a regular G type antiferromagnet. Because it's a multiferic, there's a strong magnetoelectric coupling, which is stabilizing a cycloid. So um, the cycloid is always propagating perpendicularly to the electric polarization and it's an antiferromagnetic cycloid which means that actually if you look at this from above the sample you expect that you will not see any magnetic field because it's completely compensated at the atomic scale so if you are 50 nanometers away you don't expect to be able to do anything that's where uh, the dolchinsky moria interaction helps us because it's inducing a small Counting of the magnetic fields, um, which is uh, producing weak un uncompensated moments. So actually it's a spin density wave, which is attached to the cycloid. So there's a small magnetic moment, which, is, um, which has an amplitude, which is oscillating with the same special period as a cycloid. And that's the way we're gonna probe it. So it's a little indirect, but that's producing enough field for us to work. And as I said before, the cycloid direction is always perpendicular to the polarization. And actually there are three uh, favorized directions. So this K1, K2, K3 in the 111 plane of the structure of business right. So the, we did a lot of work on thin films before, but I'm not gonna uh, talk about that today. I'm going to talk about what we did in bulk PFO single crystals in collaboration with uh, the team of Vincent Garcia and Stéphane Cousy at the UMR CNRS Thales and Jean-Yves Jolot and Michel Viret at the SPEC. So here is a, an image of the stray field above a bulk PFO single crystal. So you see the alternating uh, stripes, which are the signature of the cycloid, of the spin density wave attached to the cycloid, but I'm going to say the cycloid uh, in the rest. And um, you see we can actually measure the value of the stray field. And from that, uh, we can do some quantitative analysis because you can compute the stray field that you expect from the spin density wave. And since you can also measure the flying distance of your MD center, you can do some quantitative analysis. So you can take a profile and you can fit it with this awful formula that you can get from calculations. 
And from that, you can, in particular, extract the value of this uncompensated magnetic moment in this pin density rate. And we found a good agreement with some uh, neutron measurements that were performed before. So, so far, it looks quite simple. And then we moved on the question. And we found that actually it's not so simple. So we don't have just one cyclic propagation direction. We can have things like that with the three K1, K2, K3 that we could expect. But the, the weird thing here is that we are in a single ferroelectric domain. So we don't expect that at all. From what we know from simplium, we never saw that. And uh, if you can move further and find some even weirder, weirder spots, where well, it's just whirling around. So we were a little puzzled. So we went for uh, X-ray scattering. So this we did with Nicolas Jaouen at Soleil. And we found that actually the diffraction pattern is, is an ellipse. So if there was a single cycloid propagation, we would expect just one dot at this K1, for example. If we had the three coexisting, we will expect three dots, but actually we have the full ellipse. So it's rotating in any direction, it looks like. And um, we correlated that with our measurements. We took all our images and we took all the spots where we could define a K vector and measure the period. And we reported that on this plot and we found actually the same ellipse. So it seems that at the surface of the crystal, the K vectors are just um, describing the whole cycles and not just the three directions that I mentioned before. And this seems to be a surface effect because uh, both techniques are probing the few first 10 tenths of nanometers at the surface. And there was measurement on the very same crystals by neutrons 10 years ago, uh, which said there's only K1 inside and neutrons can go through. So it means that this should be a surface effect but we don't know much more about that. And uh, actually, if you think again about the images I just shown you, this looks quite familiar, this type of pattern. And uh, actually, if you look in uh, many different types of system in physics, you find the same uh, in polymers, in other magnetic systems, in fluids. As long as you have a lamellar structure, you will get um, this type of defects forming at any length scale. That's the cool thing about it. So um, we looked again at our images and actually we found uh, the three types of defect that you expect from this type of lamellar structure. So they are called topological because they, they are kind of protected by the structure. You can define a winding numbers around them and so on. But I'm not going to go into these details today. But uh, you can find this pi discrimination, this minus pi discrimination, so the Y shape. And you can also find this kind of half turn, this eighty location, uh, inside our multiferric uh, material. So the, that opens some perspectives for electrical control of this. Um, in contrast with the work that was done before on flow magnets where similar types of defects were found. So that was my contribution to the study of antiferal magnets today. Um, and now I'm going to talk about this part where it's still an antiferal magnet, but it's a different perspective. Um, the idea is that uh, I've shown you what we can do when you have a small uncompensated moment in your material that can create the little stray field that the ND center can detect. But uh, if you have a fully compensated, perfect antiferal magnet, this is not gonna work. So we have to find something else. And this something else is magnetic noise. Uh, because the NV center is sensitive to uh, magnetic fluctuations, as long as there is an overlap between the spectrum of this fluctuation and the magnetic resonance frequency. And uh, the idea of the experiment will be the following. You have an antiferal magnet with thermally excited spin wave. And um, when there is a domain wall, this noise which is produced by the magnetic fluctuation will be different because the dispersion of spin waves is different inside the domain. And your NV center will be a bit able to detect this variation of the noise. So to show that, 
first, let me um, talk briefly about the effect of this noise on the, on the photophysics of the ND center. So we can build a quite simple model with three levels. For, as I said, um, zero state is bright, plus minus one states are dark. And we have to take into account two things. First, the polarization of the system in the state zero by the green laser and the relaxation, which is bringing the system back into its thermal equilibrium where the three states are equally populated. And the important point is that this relaxation rate gamma one depends on the magnetic field spectral density at this frequent, as the magnetic resonance frequency of the ND center. And um, from this little model, you can compute the photoemissions that you expect from the NV center when you change the relaxation time. So when you change the noise intensity, actually, if you are in a low noise uh, situation, you have a long relaxation time. So you can efficiently polarize your system in the bright state. So you have a lot of photoluminescence. But if you increase the noise, meaning you decrease the relaxation time, you will see a drop of the PA because you do not polarize as efficiently because it's going too fast again in the dark state. And so you see a drop in PF because of this competition between the optical pumping and the spin relaxation. And we checked that uh, experimentally and we found a good agreement with our very simple model and the data. <coughs> and one last thing that I want you to see is that we expect a significant contrast that we will be able to use for imaging. So the idea is that we want to detect sources of magnetic noise. And the system we used is a synthetic antifold magnet. So that was grown at the UMR Serenera Stales by William Legrand. And the, the nice thing about these samples is that they have no net magnetic moment. The two layers are fully compensated. Um, the dipolar effects are also compensating. So if you want to, for example, have scramions in them and so on, it's very interesting because you expect them to be smaller. But very important for us, you still expect a small stray field above the layer just because um, you are closer from the top layer than from the bottom layer with your ND center. So that's a good test system for imaging because we can do both. We can do the quantitative measurement, same as we did on BFO, and we can try this noise imaging. So let's do it. Sorry. Um, so here you have a map of what we record when we just scan the NV center above this synthetic antifold magnet. So you see that you get dark lines and these dark lines are actually domain walls where you see a drop of the photoluminescence because there is magnetic noise coming from this domain wall. So you can check with the map of the stray field that you have actually a domain wall there. And you also check from the profile that it's exactly the type of domain wall that you expect in this type of sample. So now let me prove that it's actually noise related. And to do that, uh, we measure the relaxation time directly instead of just looking at the photoluminescence. So to do that, we just use a sequence of laser pulses. We use the first pulse to bring the laser in the bright, the laser, to bring the NV center in the bright state. And then we turn it off. We let the system relax in the dark and we turn it on again to read. And uh, depending on the signal that we get there, we can know if the system is more in the bright state or more in the dark state and so on. And we get this type of curve. So first we did that with the tube far away from the sample. We get a curve like this. So it's an exponential decay. And the T1 that we get from there is about one, mac one millisecond. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so that's uh, what you expect for an ND center in a tip like this. And then we brought the tip closer to the sample above a domain, so far away from a line. And you see first drop of the relaxation time, 220 microseconds. And then we went above a domain wall and we saw a further drop, 20 microseconds. So the thing that we see is really related to the enhancement of the spin relaxation because there is magnetic noise around. And this magnetic noise must come from spin waves. And to understand really what's happening, we worked 
in collaboration with uh, Jovan Kim at the Citroën, who did some calculation for us of the dispersion of the spin waves in all system. And you see that inside the domain, so here, you have a gap in your dispersion and the resonance frequency of the NV center is just below. So um, you don't expect to be able to detect the noise from the spin waves inside the domain. But uh, if you look closely, you see that the dispersion is quite broad. There's a big tail and we are actually in the tail. That's the explanation of the fact that when your tip is far away, you have a longer relaxation time than when your tip is close to the domain. So that's this first effect that we see, just from the fact that from the fact that we are in the tail of the dispersion. But now, if you look at what happens in the wall, the dispersion is completely different. You're closing the gap, and so you have strong modes at the resonance frequency of the ND center, and it means that you are much more sensitive to the spin waves that are channeled inside the wall, and that's why you see this contract on the domain wall. And they also computed some maps of the noise that we expect, and we find very good agreement with, the, with our images. And then we wanted to look at camions. So I'm gonna skip the part where we tried this with a sample of the, of the UMS and RSLS because it was rough and didn't really work. But then we get samples from SkinTech from the group of Olivier Bull where actually the scammers are just stabilized by pinning. So you increase the field to simulate them and then you go back to zero. And uh, we found that we could detect uh, this kind of big bubbles. And in the noise map, you see they are still there, exactly like before on the domain walls. And uh, I also checked that the uh, relaxation time we are doing exactly the same things than on the other samples. And when we look closely at the images, you can look closely at this small guy here. It doesn't look like a nice ring. It looks like a half ring or something like that. And uh, we digged a little bit further into that. We looked at many of them and we found that we never have this full ring here. And uh, we were wondering if this could be an indication of the structure inside this camera. And so, um, well, we looked at uh, about 20 of them so it's very noisy, but it seems that um, if you take the control around it and plot the PL, depending on this angle around this camion, you have some pattern coming up. So of course it's noisy because they don't have all the same shape. You might have defects that are changing the noise intensity and so on. But we found 20 of them and something seems to come out. And actually Jovan also did some calculation, also adding disorder in the sample. And he found that for the type of scammer that you expect, the noise should be larger at the zero angle. And you see, you have to think about the curve flipped because this is the noise intensity and this is the PL. So well, for higher noise, you expect lower PL. So actually, it looks like we have good agreement. So this is still work in progress, but uh, looks promising. And uh, let me finish by just showing you what else uh, we are doing. Um, so, um, NV centers are not limited to probing magnetic stuff. So, of course, we can look at static magnetic fields, as I just show, shown, to look at antiflow or ferromagnetic textures. Also, we can look at current distributions from the earth field field that we create. Uh, I showed you that we can look at magnetic noise to probe spin waves, but also you can probe conductivity through the magnetic noise by the, looking at the Johnson noise of the electrons, of the conduction electrons, and measure conductivity uh, this way. But you can also, in principle, look at electric field. I will come back to that in a, in a minute, but instead of using Zeeman effect for magnetic field, you look at Stark effect from electric field. And in principle, we could look at for electric materials. And you can also probe temperature uh, and then in principle uh, detect uh, no localized hotspots at the nanoscale in a circuit, for example, or whatever. So I will just briefly show you what we are doing in these directions. Uh, first thing is this electric field sensing. So as I said, uh, it's the same principle as for magnetic field. 
just that we are looking at Stark effect instead of Zeeman effect. But actually it's much more complicated because the Zeeman effect is much, much stronger than the Stark effect. So as soon as you have a little magnetic field, you don't see the Stark effect anymore. So you have two options. Either you make sure that you are completely in zero field, but this is complicated. Uh, in particular, the magnetic field from Earth is already an issue from the first test that we did. Or you can apply magnetic field perpendicular to the axis of the MV center. So the MV center has an axis which is defined by the nitrogen atom and the vacancy. And actually the field that we are probing is only the components along this axis. And if you have apply the field perpendicular, you can start mixing the states and protect them a little bit from the Zeeman in the perpendicular direction. And then you can access the Stark effect. But even if you do that, it's still hard because the susceptibility to electric field are much, much smaller than to magnetic field. So then you have to use more complicated spin equisequences to improve the sensibility of the, of the sensor. So there have been two first demonstrations of scanning electrometry very recently, and uh, we are actually working to set this up in Montpellier. Another thing is that you can also probe temperature. And uh, the, here the principle is that uh, when the temperature changes, you have a little change in the, in the dilatation of the diamond itself. So uh, this induces a shift of the zero field splitting uh, between the zero and the plus minus one states. So I, I, uh, in the beginning, maybe you remember, I wrote 2.87 gigahertz. So that's the usual room temperature value. But if you are at higher temperature, it's going down because you increase the spacing between the two electrons inside the defect. So here you have an example. So this is a spectrum at zero field at 28 degrees and then you can increase the temperature here to 78 and you see a shift of the, of the resonance so this is a way to probe temperature and so this is something that we are working on but the the very important point is that diamond is a very good uh, thermal conductor so that's both uh, an advantage and an issue uh, the issue is that if your sensor is too big all the heat goes in the diamond and uh, you don't see anything. The good thing is that uh, you can have your sensor completely thermalized and uh, you can have a lot of envies probing exactly the same temperature, improving the sensitivity. So we worked with uh, Pinami to design some uh, very specific probes uh, for this type of application. And uh, so we are working on that. The, we have trouble with the sample actually right now to find the localized hotspot that we can probe. And finally, uh, let me just advertise a new direction that we are taking. It's the use of other defects than the NV center. So uh, you probably noticed that uh, 2D materials are uh, very fancy at the moment. And uh, the nice thing is that you can build the structures with uh, layers with different properties. And one of the layers that a lot of people are using is boron nitride because it's a uh, it's a good um, encapsulation layer. And uh, actually it was found that there are defects in boron nitride, which are actually the boron vacancies that have almost exactly the same properties at the end center. So uh, you can get the same spectra as with the NV, uh, just at slightly different frequency. Um, and then you can do the same magnetic field measurements. Uh, the only difference is that uh, VB minus defects are very bad emitters, so it doesn't work with a single one. You have to work with an ensemble. And uh, an experiment that we did recently is that we took a flake of a magnetic material. So here it's premium detail right because it's magnetic at room temperature. It's very convenient. And we put a flake of HBN on top but it's not regular HBN, HBN, it's HBN irradiated with neutrons to create an ensemble of boron vacancies inside. So there's a full layer of defects actually inside this yellow flake. And then you can see if you zoom in there, you see that the photoluminescence 
of these defects is enhanced at, on top of the cremant deuteride because it's metallic. But you can see then the form of the magnetic plate, the shape of the magnetic plate, sorry. And then you can record the magnetic image, just doing the same as with the NV. At every point you record the spectrum and you, you measure the magnetic field. And uh, so you see that we uh, get the ma magnetic map that we expect from the flake, which is uniformly magnetized along this direction if you compare with uh, some simulation. So you don't get the same spatial resolution as with NVs, but the really nice thing is that you can integrate this in your entire structure and have your sensor inside your sample. So this brings me to the end. So I'll just summarize again with my outline slide. And to finish, I also, of course, need to acknowledge all the people that participated in all the things that I've shown from Montpellier, from the UMRC and SLS, from the SPEC, from Soleil, from the Citroën, and from Syntec, and you for your attention. Well, thank you all for this uh, very, again, another yet interesting talk uh, about the very nice uh, perspectives. <laughs> uh, do we have questions in the audience? Uh, Romain. I just have a question. When you measure the T1 above the domain in the synthetic antiferromagnet. magnet, do you try to measure T1 on a magnetic, mat I mean, on top of magnetic domain where the gap of the spin wave is larger and you really see no effect on T1? Uh, so we did a few quick experiments. Uh, we tried just a cobalt layer, so a ferro magnet, where actually you expect the gap to be smaller. And we found that T1 was very short on top of this. And we also made a very quick shot on BFO, which is an antiferromagnet, so you expect the gap to be much, much larger, and we didn't see anything. So, but that's still things that we have to investigate, but looks like it's working the way we expect. Question from Vasily, then, then Martin, you, you will be able to ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you for this. Uh, a very different talk again. I have a techni two technical questions because I probably I've overlooked. Uh, could you repeat once again how you define uh, magnetic noise and how you interpret it and what is the meaning of, of, of T1? Do you have T2, do you have T2 star or, or not? Yes, so what I call magnetic noise is just a randomly fluctuating magnetic field. So coming from this thermal excitation in the material here. Yes. No, 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 it's from the sample. And actually when we did the, the experiment that I shown at the beginning, when we checked the effect on the PL of the noise, yeah, so this, the setup we used for that was a bulk diamond with an NV center and a wire, and we sent white noise, white noise in the wire. So that's creating a fluctuating current, so fluctuating earth state field, and that's what we used as magnetic noise. Okay, so it's really randomly fluctuating magnetic field. Okay, and then, uh, yes, I just talked about T1, but of course you can measure T2 and T2 star, and uh, that's also very important. Uh, that's the coherence properties of the spin. And in particular, T2, it's very important for the spin echo measurement that I showed for the electric field sensing. Because uh, if your T2 is too short, you cannot do this kind of experiments. So that's also very important properties. And the, the NV centers are very interesting also as uh, qubits because they have a long T2. Martin? Yeah, thanks for the talk, Google. I have a, first a technical question. What do you expect uh, will be the um, best temperature resolution you can achieve using this technique? 
So that's something I didn't show, but we measured it with the this specific tips. And uh, we are roughly about one Kelvin per square root of Earth. So this is not so good, but still we can work with that. Yes, and, the, the point uh, is that it's very local, yeah. And my second question regards uh, the T2 time that you just talked about. In the end, uh, do, do you foresee the ability to uh, place individual spin cubics in interaction using uh, the NV center in diamond or the uh, vacancy in, uh, in hexagonal boron nitride? But uh, could, could, you, could you look at uh, quantum entanglement between these spins using this approach, would you say? So yes, so we are not really working about that, but some people do, in particular, trying to untangle two NV centers through a spin wave. That's something that some people work on. Um, so we are not really into this because you need to go to low temperature and so on. So it's making everything more difficult, but that's definitely something you can do. But um, you should rather use NVs for that than uh, bone vacancies because the currents for ball vacancy it's much worse because uh, in boron nitride there are spins everywhere on the nitrogen and the boron and so the currents is much worse than for NVs. Thank you. Okay, I just have one ah, okay just one 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 question with very technical question but uh because you you've shown very nice curves but uh how hard is it to get the signal because you said roughly you shine a laser and then you measure something else, but uh, you, well, is it complicated? Or? So um, getting the ESR, the, the spectrum of the NV is not hard. Um, you just have to find a good way to apply the microwave. But uh, I mean, you can do that with just a dirty wire. So doing this is not hard. You just need a confocal microscope and a, a kind of dirty antenna next to it. Um, then for maps, it's a bit harder uh, because um, you also need to be very close to the surface. So if you, for example, catch some dirt on your tip, you might lose your signal. Or, right, it's the same for every scanning probe type of measurements. Uh, and also for the noise measurement, I didn't show it, but you have to tune the laser power you are more sensitive to the, um, to the noise depending on the laser power. So you have to also be careful with that. What's typically, what, is, what is the typical um, um, uh, measurement time, acquisition time for, uh, for, for an image and what are the spatial dimensions of one image that you are? So we can scan up to a few microns, maybe 10 so so. It depends on the, on the AFM. If we have a good AFM, we can go to 10, 20. If we have a bad AFM, it's more one or two. And um, for a um, quantitative field map, it's a few hours. For just a map of the photoluminescence, it's more half an hour. So it depends on what you want and how precise you want your measurement to be. But our time scale. Initials on, uh, on the image, uh, uh, just of curiosity, I didn't see where the microwave uh, uh, is on the, the image of your AFM tip. I didn't see the microwave. Uh. So um, you have two ways to apply the microwave. So in this microscope here, actually, it's on the it's on the sample. Oh, sorry. So in the um, in this microscope here, which is the home built microscope. Actually, the antenna is on the sample. There's a strip line pattern on the sample. Uh, we have another microscope, a commercial one, where actually there's a, another, um, uh, an external antenna, which is brought very close to the chip from outside. So it's just a loop, a wire loop, which is brought a few microns away from the chip. So like here, you have the antenna. You can also do that. Yeah, but I think it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, because the tip is a few microns uh, size, and uh, you cannot 
put anything above because you don't want to block the light. You cannot put anything below because of, of course you have your sample coming below. So you have to be on the side. You have a few microns, but it's tricky. I think some people are working on that, but it's tricky. <laughs> 